Hello and welcome to this episode of Real Musicians Don't Starve. Uh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, I'm really excited about this. We're going to spend some time today with my friend Bjorgvin Benedictson. And Bjorgvin is a phenomenal engineer, amazing <laughs> mixer. He's uh, We're going to talk about this here in a second. He's an incredible teacher. But on top of all of that, he's also a best-selling author, which I think is it's just so cool. Uh, he has a book out called uh, you, you Get What You Give, and it's a simple story for finding success in the music business. So uh, so super, super amazing that that was a, a bestseller. Uh, it's absolutely a wealth uh, of, of information uh, when it comes to recording and mixing. And, uh, and for those of you who are uh, fortunate enough to uh, be subscribers to his email list, uh, you get super, super, super valuable, high quality teaching literally every day from him. And this, uh, this guy is, I, I joke with him, but, but I, I've, I've told him multiple times, you're a machine <laughs> because of the quality that you, that you uh, share, the quality of content that you share on a daily basis with your audience uh, through audio issues is, uh, it really is, is unparalleled. So, uh, man, I'm excited to to have you join us today and uh, excited to hear what you're going to share with us. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. I'm uh, happy to share everything I know. Well, you know, you've been obviously working in the industry for for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but I just kind of want to dive right into uh, what, you know, you're always teaching and you were telling me before, before we went live, like, you know, how, how you're now, you know, working with uh, the local college, you know, yeah. where you're at and stuff like that. How do you continue? Uh, what are your strategies that you've implemented yourself to continue to, to learn and grow yourself? Cause you're always sharing information, right? right. You know, what are you doing? How are you feeding yourself? How are you feeding the machine? Sure. I think this is a very interesting question and really uh, a fun one to answer because I think it goes all the way back to just when Audio Issues started. The reason Audio Issues started was I was learning and I was aware of what I was learning and I was thinking, you know, people don't know this. Maybe maybe I can like pass on this knowledge. And I started writing, started blogging about what I was learning in audio school. And then I attracted an audience that way. And I like to say that, like, I started writing about audio 12 years ago and I just never stopped. And that's how my business grew. Yeah. Um, but today, because, you know, you lear I learned about audio and then I built the business and I learned about business and I started teaching about some of the business stuff, too. So it's a lot of times being aware of what you're learning and also just being you know, voracious reader. I, I love reading business books and, and you know, self-help books in, in all sorts of um, all, all types. And yeah. just being aware of, you know, the things that you're solving for yourself are probably things that other people have have issues with and would like to know a solution to it. And so if you can formulate that into a solution if you can talk about a problem better than uh the other person that has the same problem if you know that problem and can solve it for them um mm -hmm. that's I, th I think there's a lot of growth to be had in just paying forward what you're learning right a, a lot of that also comes down to just creating systems and learning systems that that yeah. work yeah yeah and yeah. implement it just, oh and then that's one thing too is like don't just learn to learn learn to apply you know yeah. Uh, if you don't apply the stuff that you're reading about, it's just knowledge, which is great to have. And you can be, you know, maybe a really good professor or, or a, a person, but you're not really a person of practice. You yeah. know, you're, you're a person that's full of wisdom or full of knowledge in that way. But if you haven't applied your lessons or the things that you learned, they haven't truly solidified. Um, and you haven't learned the specific ways that they you know, th th those applications have worked for you. Maybe there's some, maybe what you learned isn't exactly the, the, the way that you thought it was going to be. You run into some mistakes and you find a new thing that mm -hmm. works and then that becomes what you teach, you know? Well, the other thing too, we were, we were talking about before we started recording is, uh, you know, you, you learn things from all these other resources, yeah. you know, and, but the reality is they don't always line up with the industry 
for example, that you're working in. So you have to apply it. You have to learn even how to tweak it yeah. so that it works. And of course, just, just in general, you know, especially now with technology and all that stuff changing things so quickly that, you know, you may have, you may be reading something in a book that was released 10 years ago, but it was written, you know, 15 years ago, right? Cause you know, there's, there's a, there's a duration of time that, that happens between finishing a book and, and, and it getting out there, especially through publishers, right? right, right. <laughs> which, which, you know, yourself, yeah. but, but the reality is that even, even a book as recent as 10 years ago, there's certain elements that will not be relevant simply because of technology. And we see that when it comes to music, when it comes to recording, when it comes to, I mean, even home recording just in the last 15 yeah. years, yeah. the, the, not, only, not, not even the difference in, in the, in the technology, of course, you know, back 15 years ago, you had to have hardware, even yeah. like ADATs or DA88s and, yeah. you know, physical hardware. Now it's all virtual on a computer for the most part, but but also the the techniques uh, to create modern music, are, they they are different. For things to sound current, it requires uh, you know different different uh, processes yeah. than than what you were doing you know twenty years ago. Yeah, I mean just sound experimentations, trends in sound design, trends in like instrumentation. Uh, I remember like, I think you had a blog post or a video or something about that when in like, and you talk about this a lot, you have to listen to the songs in the, in the, oh, yeah. in the films and the TV shows to see what's in and what's, what's good, yeah. and what you should focus on. And I remember you, I think it was you who said like, oh, and then I started hearing a bunch of ukulele music. Oh yeah, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then you just started writing a bunch of ukulele songs because that's what the music supervisors were looking for. Right. Yeah. There was a, there was a season, I think back in 2013, I feel is when it was yeah. where it was probably about nine months. Uh, you could not escape ukulele music in commercials. It was every, every commercial. I mean, I, I say every, but it was probably like 80% uh, was ukulele. And I remember one day I just went out and I got a ukulele and, um, and I spent the next 15 days. I dedicated the next 15 days to making an ukulele record. And I did one track a day and, you know, uh, you know, I was working with a lot of different artists and singers and stuff like that at that time. So if, if I had, if I was working with someone and on their project or whatever, and they were over at my place, I would just have them quickly lay down some vocals for me too, you know? So, so, uh, uh, during that time, I was able to utilize a lot of different musicians to get a lot of oohs and ahs. Cause again, when you're listening to these commercials, not only was it ukulele music with, you know, a cool little drum, drum groove and some glockenspiel and all that stuff, but you also had the oohs and the ahs and the cutesy little, um, nonverbal vocals. And mm -hmm. so I would just, Hey, if, if you're over at my house, Hey, let me, let me get you to do some quick oohs and ahs with me and some <laughs> la la la's. And, and you know, what's funny is, is I, in about two weeks, I think it took me 15 days, maybe 16 days, um, to, to make that record. Uh, I don't even know how many commercials I had from that, but yeah. I, I would say I had probably at least four, at least four international uh, major commercials as a result of that uh, little ukulele record that I spent two weeks on. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. You got to pay attention to what's happening, but, but even like stylistically, like, you know, when you're, when you're listening to radio, you can, you turn on the radio now yeah. and you hear the difference in production, just in the production yeah. as, as, as you scroll to like another radio station where they're playing songs from say like the eighties. Right. Right. It's, you know, songwriting is songwriting. You got to have good songs. You have to have good choruses, but there's a distinct difference in the quality of production. Now I shouldn't even say the quality of production. I should say the, the audio, right. Yeah. Just the uh, overall sheen of it all. In a sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and that you, you just have to, you know, you take what you learn and you have to bring it into the modern age. So let's, let's talk about, since we were talking about a little bit of that, that ramp up there, uh, I would love to have you talk about your, your book for a moment. Sure. Yeah. So you get what you give a simple story for finding success in the music business came about because there wasn't a business parable for the musician, musician, music producer, if you will. So I don't know if you're, well, you're probably familiar with, but if people don't know what a business parable is, it's basically a business book, but I wrote it like a fictional story. So it's almost like kind of reads like a novel, mm -hmm. uh, 
but it's character driven and it's mostly uh, conversation driven because it's a story about Casey who's working in a marketing agency, hates his job, but he has a lot of money from his job and he spends it all on equipping his studio. So he has like a really nice home studio, but he has to go to work every day and never really is able to you know, follow his passion and make music as his, as his dream job, dream career. One day he gets fed up with it. He rage quits his job. Um, I almost wrote it like um, Edward Norton in Fight Club uh, quitting okay. his job, but that was a bit too much. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, the book is a lot more rock and roll than suit and tie of the other business parables because it is the, in the music industry. But uh, he rage quits his job, and then the day after he realizes, all right, I got to start this studio business. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I don't know. I have all this gear. I know how to use the gear. Uh, he went to audio school, but he has no idea of how to get clients and how to run a business, how to market and promote yeah. himself. And so after, after his first gig, he gets a gig with like a really bad band, like a, a band, like, you know, one of the nightmare clients that everybody's probably had at one point or another, realizing that, you know, um, going down to the bottom of the barrel is not a best place to build a career. Uh, and he's, you know, drowning the sorrows with his friend at the bar and, and his friend has connections to a music mentor. And so in the typical sort of hero's journey, we meet the mentor who is, who is a successful music producer executive of his own. And through a series of lunches and meetings with the mentor and some other characters uh, throughout the story, he learns sort of the five success principles or the success strategies he needs uh, to succeed with his music, with his uh, with his music business, if you will. Wow, this this you're, the way you explain it to me, it, it reminds me a lot a lot of a book uh, that that I love called The Go Giver, which is also oh, yeah. like a business mentorship. Oh, I type wrote of book. I, yeah, basically, it's the go giver for music producers. That's exactly why why I wrote it. I want that's awesome. Yeah, so. Yeah, that that's oh man. So go giver, uh, that that makes sense too. Go giver was a great mentorship. Uh, I'm sorry, great business parable. Yeah. So this is this is the music business parable, and uh, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, you you said something there. Um, you know, when it comes to um, as a musician, I think the hardest thing that a lot of people encounter is the decision that they're going to make to actually move forward, right? Uh, you know, a lot of musicians spend a lot of time on their songwriting, you know, and in their bedroom perfecting their skill set yeah. as, a, as a player, maybe writing songs, you know? Yeah. Um, they have the mindset of, of oh, this is, you know, I'm, 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 I love music. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become someone. I'm going to do this. Yeah. But they... But they have a hard time with that decision, right? And yeah. and and I find that a lot of times, at least with the musicians that I talk to, they have the skill set. They've really developed an incredible skill set. This is what's what's frustrating a lot of the time. Yeah. How amazing some of them are. Yeah, like they're really amazing. They have they have the mindset. You know, they have that focus. You can't develop that skill set without having the mindset and the discipline to yeah. sit down and focus and, and put that time into your craft. But the problem, of course, is that fear. It's that taking, taking that next step. So aside for you, for your own journey, yeah. aside from the skill set that you developed, aside from the mindset, you know, even to look at things from a business perspective, what would you say uh, has been the most prominent contributor to the success that you've had? Ooh, interesting question. Um, I, I, said, I, I, took, I took a long time setting that one up. Yeah, no, 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 I get it. Uh, I mean, like a lot of times it's about taking action in the face of fear because some, and, and you know, in the book, we talk, I talk a lot about what you were sort of mentioning in, in a way. It's like this aspect of imposter syndrome. You have all this stuff and you're good at it, but you're still kind of afraid of putting yourself out there and showing people your work. And I have met so many musicians that 
have sent me their tracks and they're like, oh, I don't know if this is good enough. And I'm listening to it. I'm like, damn, this is so good. Yeah. All you, all you need to do is like just reduce like the harshness in the 2K and release this. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know that needs that little. But I think it is uh, realizing that that it's, you know, in the face of fear, nobody's actually judging you. Nobody's actually told you that uh, you should be afraid of any of any of this stuff. And you you're just as likely or you're just as um, uh, you deserve a spot out there just as much as anybody else. And I think like just taking action and testing things out, experimenting, putting yourself out there a little bit, you know, building and building an audience and then seeing what resonates with people as you put stuff out there um, will sort of help guide you. So before before we we hopped on a call here, mm-hmm. I was I was looking through your website and you have a, a great blog. At, at least at the time of this recording, it's it, I think it's like the second or third one went down on your on your homepage. So of course it'll be a little further down uh, when when you're listening to this. But you're talking about how you hate how you love the haters. That was <laughs> I think the, the title of it. And and you know of course that's fascinating to me. So I went in and I started reading it. And you're talking about like how you know there is that fear of course of of putting your stuff out there, of putting your music out there, of just you know getting your name out there in, in whatever capacity. You know you spend so long in, in you know perfecting your ability, but then there's that fear of getting out because oh my gosh, what if they hate me? But you yeah. made a great point. In, in that in that article where you said you know the reality is that the haters they're they're the old curmudgeons who never did anything anyway because the reality is that if you were to send your music to a professional like yeah. by a professional i mean someone who's really achieved a lot in their career musically and in, in the business and let's say it's not up it's not up to par let's say you send it to a to a to a producer or a mixer or someone like that you know they wouldn't write you back and be like, this sucks, blah, 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 blah. What they would do is they'd say exactly what you just said. Hey, you might need to fix a little bit up, up, up in the 2K. You might need to do a little bit here down down with, with the bass. I'm losing the bass and the kick drum definition, blah, 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 right? They're, they're going to help you. It's, right. it's, it's just the nature of successful people to, I think, in my opinion, help others up the ladder. But the haters, the haters you have to ignore. Because oh, yeah. the haters are the ones exactly. who've never done anything. They're the ones who are projecting their own failures wow. onto Je- you. And jealousy too, because yeah. they see something that somebody else has achieved that they maybe thought they could have done and then gave up on. So, so the fear is you're you're fearing what some insignificant person thinks yeah. about you. Yeah, and that's what's so hard about it is like you can get ten gushing emails about your content. And then you get one hate mail and that hate mail outweighs everything. It's just like, I don't know if it's just the psychology of how we're made. I wish I could switch that off. And I know that other people can, you know, feel that way, but, but it's, it's annoying because you go, you go to Amazon, find like a, a, a best-selling book on Amazon that has like thousands of reviews and it's all like four and a half stars. I guarantee you there's some loser in the ones that gave it a one star review uh that's just trying to drag that author down and there's yeah. like thousands of other people that found it helpful yeah you, you can look at someone like like a dan brown who's had like what three <laughs> movies made out of his books or three or four movies yeah. right obviously a monster you know monstrously successful writer but yeah i'm sure you could find a lot of uh, a, a couple people who are going to be like, this is the worst thing I ever read. Well, if it's the worst thing you ever read, why is it a massive movie with Tom Hanks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe it's just not for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a good thing that you're actually not like, you know, working at a movie, th- movie studio, <laughs> actually determining, you know, what's going to be massively <laughs> successful in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, <for> yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, but, but that, but that brings up a good point. It's, it's that fear of rejection, you know, and the mindset has to be, you have to really look at, you know, if you're if you're fearful of rejection, yeah, which a lot of people are, and you know, let's face it, you know, the music industry is full of rejection. It, it, but but you do have to take a step back and you have to look at it and be like, who's rejecting me? If if, you're out, if I'm on stage playing a song, and there's someone you know like you know in, in the crowd yelling stuff, who is that? That's just some drunk idiot yeah. who has no idea what they're even doing, right? Now now when you look at it like that, it's insignificant. But if you're like, oh my gosh, there's someone. 
there's someone saying something right now. They're speaking over me. Oh my gosh, they, I must really suck. Then, then you you totally you, you create this false narrative, yeah, uh, right of 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 who you're fearful of. And uh, but you know there there is that rejection, and and I think that uh, uh, it, it's something that you have to expect. No matter no matter if you're pursuing a career as an engineer, as a producer, yeah. as a songwriter, as a player, it doesn't matter. You know, it's you aren't going to be the right fit for everyone, but but the reality is that you have to you have to you have to force your way through that. So my question to you would be, because we've all experienced it, uh, what are some of the strategies that you've implemented into your own career to uh, you know continue walking through and and uh, you know the, the times when um, you know when you were facing rejection? Uh, sure. So I mean to a, a few things just in general in order to sort of be able to capture those fear thoughts and look at them objectively i've always found that meditation helps because if you think of those little fear thoughts as like a little demons in your head uh they can run amok but if you've trained your brain to be able to see them and then then it's easier for you to just like dismiss them because and this one, one of the uh, a book popped up in my head that I would recommend called Soundtracks by John Acuff. He's a really oh. good writer. And he talks all about this sort of the soundtracks we have about ourselves in our heads and some of the negativity that that we all deal with. And so a lot of times it's about asking, you know, is is this thought true and what's the worst that can happen? Because usually the worst that can happen is so insignificant yeah. versus the upside, right? Yeah. You know, the the best thing can happen is I, I'm going to be incredibly popular. And the worst thing can happen is like I might get one email or I might get rejected by this person uh, or not, or crickets, which yeah. in if you look at it objectively, isn't that big of a deal. You know, it's not like you're remortgaging your house and putting all risk on, you know, like creating like incredible financial risk for yourself you, usually obviously like that you you can be making those decisions if if you are working at a, a different level maybe but I'm, I'm talking about like smaller decisions and how to get over you know rejection and and a lot of times the success can often be a numbers game I'm sure you're familiar with you know when you you know how many how many outreach emails do you have to write in order to get somebody to reply to you? How many, uh, mm -hmm. how many submissions do you need to, to make in order to get one placement or things like that? It's kind of a numbers game. And like, <laughs> how do you get good at mixing? You practice it. Yeah. You know, you know and how do, you, how do you build a career like, or a music career, like one song at a time or one, you know, one customer, how do you build a business? One customer at a time. You know? Yeah. The numbers, the numbers really all, all do work back down to like, say like the 80, 20 rule, yeah. you know, and it, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, I sent out three emails and I never heard back from anyone. And I think 20% of three is less than one. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't expect you to hear back from anyone if you sent three emails, because you have, you have to look at the 80, 20 rule, right? So, so you got to send out five. Yeah. Really, you know, you know, to, yeah. to get one, but that doesn't mean that that one is automatically a yes. That's just a reply. Right. 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 You know, so, so when you look at 80, 20 and then 80, 20 on multiple levels, yeah. that that's the, that's the numbers game. Now that's the average. Now, if you doesn't mean that that's how it always is. If, if you're really good at connecting with people, yeah. then, then, you know, you may send out five emails and hear from two people. Well, then you're really kind of like, you know, the, 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 what is that? That's like the 40, the 40, 60, right? <laughs> but, but you can always use 80, 20 as, as, as a base number. So for example, if you sent out 20 emails and you didn't hear back from anyone, where in reality, you should have heard back from on average around four. Yeah. If you didn't hear from anyone after 20 emails then or 20 attempts to connect with someone, then you need to stop what you're doing and you need to reassess how you're going going through that because the health of of what you're doing is 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 not healthy it's not right. working right you need to re readdress how you're addressing people so to speak right. totally and at, you know talking about sort of spinning it into talking about growth is like you're you decide to do something let's say you have a strategy for outreach or whatever 
there's always this time for evaluation and reflection where you're like, all right, is this working? Uh, what what is it that's working about it? How do I double down on that? That's how you snowball like if effective success okay. is that you you lose the stuff that doesn't move the needle and you keep the stuff that you know goes into overdrive. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and find really quick. I know it's kind of last minute here, but I, I uh, whenever I hear something that's phenomenal, uh, I always pull out my phone and, and take some quick notes. Okay. And uh, and I was listening to a, um, I don't know if I can be able to find it, but I was listening to uh, the radio uh-huh. uh, and, uh, and they were, they're quoting, yeah, it, it, it took me a little while to find it, but I'll paraphrase it. Yeah. But they're, they're quoting Paul Stanley from the okay. band Kiss. Yeah. Actually, no. I think it was an interview with Paul Stanley from the band Kiss, and he was talking about John Bon Jovi. This is in the 80s. Okay. And he was basically saying, he said, if you don't know what's working for you, because he was talking about like how they were able to take right. the success of, of like the one record and then repeat it on the next record. And he said, if you don't know what's what's working for you, you're never going to be able to repeat it. And he was talking about how, like, how he really respected that band. He really respected Bon Jovi because yeah. they figured out what was working for them and then they repeated it. Right. And uh, it was just, it's, you know, just paraphrasing it. But but that's that's exactly the truth. And then you, yeah. you look at a, a band like Kiss, you know, love them or hate them. It doesn't yeah. matter. This is a band that kept repeating Right. That that success. I mean, they have massive over 100 million albums sold. I mean, that's, you know, again, you don't have to like them, but you have to respect the fact that that what they did worked and they knew what was working and they kept repeating it. Totally. Or, you know, or ACDC, man, how often have yeah. they released the same song? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's every you know, that, that's that's a great study just in songwriting, too, because yeah. listen to just the drum groove on every ACDC song. It's yeah. virtually the same drum groove. It's just a straight, you know, straight beat, but it feels good. And and there's a lot of open space in their songs, too. Lots of, you know, cut chords, dump, bump. Yeah. Totally. Um, kind of stuff and it just it feels good but that's that's their um that's, that's basically their system yeah, yeah that's, that. that's what works for them and they yeah you, they rinse and repeat yeah yeah uh we're just with just with the uh, new lyrics hey i just want to jump in here for a second and let you know that if any of your goals over the next year include recording and releasing a new album generating placements of your songs on tv shows and films or just building a fan base that will sustain your music career I want to invite you to my special workshop, Real Musicians Don't Starve. Now in this workshop, we're going to focus on the three keys that are essential to your success. And you're going to walk away with an extremely powerful strategy that allows you to create your own wow factor. And this gives you the power to attract musical opportunities to you instead of constantly struggling and chasing after them. Now you can check out this workshop for free at realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop and once again that's real musicians don't starve.com slash workshop now back to the podcast you know one of the things i always always like to to find out from uh from people is you know as we go through our our career we have our initial idea of success right and then then we reach it and then then it changes and of course you know and it should right because because what we deem as success at 15 should be completely different at 35, should be completely different at like 50, right? Oh. Um, at, at this point in your life, uh, how do you, how do you uh, define success? What, is, what does being a successful musician, someone who works in the music industry full-time, um, what, does that, what does that look like for you? So for me, you know, it's predominantly sort of an educator audio educator helping the musicians like make better music and things like that i have lots of products and and things of that nature and last year i um my wife was pregnant so i have a one-year-old now uh and well two years ago she uh she was pregnant and i used that time to make all the assets that i needed to have in order to have the life that I wanted to live as a father. Oh. And what that meant was um, freedom whenever I wanted it. 
It doesn't mean I don't work. It doesn't mean that I'm not always like working or thinking about work. It's that when I need to, I can walk out of the office and go do whatever they need me to do. Yeah. You know, so like the definition of success obviously changes uh, throughout your life. Mine has certainly changed a lot now because it's all about making sure that I can take care of her, her fam uh, my family in general. Um, and just be being there so like having a business that can run in that in that way where i'm not just constantly in the trenches uh mm. doing too much burning out i can actually just you know take her to daycare pick her up from daycare hang out on the weekends don't have anything uh that's like stressing me out or things like that uh that's my definition of success now because that's what i need i need i need I need time more than money, yeah. but obviously I've spent a lot of years making sure that I know how to make money in order to have time, right? Right, right. Uh, and, but, you know, depending on your situation or anybody, and goes back to the book, like you get what you give, like one of the last sort of success strategies is like, you have to know how to define your own success and what that success means for you because your success is not the same as somebody else's. You can't, you can't see somebody else's success and be like, okay, I'll be happy there. You, may, you might be, but you might find out that you hate that life once you've reached that milestone because you're doing too much or, or whatnot. Yeah. Um, if, if, you know, for anybody who's listening, I would also be sort of metrics based about it you know like how much money are you going to be making what like what makes you comfortable uh what is the business what is the math of success as well as the sort of holistic psychological like being able to um you know feel relatively happy with your day to day uh you need to have like that baseline because we live in a capitalistic society that loves money so <laughs> we have to yeah. have it. um yeah. and and so what does that mean for you? Like, what are your what are your expenses and what does it mean to live a life in which you feel comfortable? It's going to depend on your living situation. It's going to depend on your geographic location. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on lots of factors. But I would say work towards a number that you think is comfortable for you and then, uh, you know, kind of build the business around that number yeah. until you've reached it. Because once you've reached a, a new level, you know, some people are like struggling and w would love to make only $500, $1,000 in extra income a month from their music, and that's cool for them, right? Some people are making $10,000 a month from their music, and that is livable for them. But the problems that those two groups have are not the same problems. Right. Mm -hmm. As soon as you reach a different level, uh, you just have a new set of problems success just brings a different set of problems yeah you know? you're 100% right that that is absolutely true um you know and you you I love what you said there about you know knowing having a really clear idea of of what you need to to hit like yeah it's not it's not like well for me to be successful I have to make 10 million dollars the reality is yeah there's a uh, I think it was Tony Robbins was talking about this and actually it, he has a book called money master the game yeah. where he talks about like some guy wanted to like make a billion dollars. And he, he asked the guy, he goes, well, what would you do with that? And he's like, well, I would fly, you know, with my family, I'd fly my family, you know, in a private jet, wherever he goes, okay, how many vacations would you take a year? And he basically runs down this thing. Yeah. And he's like, well, we would go to like Aspen, you know, maybe twice a year. And he goes, uh, uh, he goes, okay, well then to fly. And he, basically broke down the numbers. He's like, yeah. instead of spending, you know, $20 million on a Learjet, you can basically spend $40,000, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, on, on, on those flights twice a year. So that's $80,000. All right. So you don't need, you know, a billion dollars or whatever it is. So you need to start with $80,000. That, that goes to that. Now what else? And he basically worked it out. He's like, for this guy to live his, his extravagant life, right. I forgot what the number ended up being, right. but it was, <laughs> it, it was something, it was something, it was something like he needed like, like $900,000, right, right. Uh, like a year, you know, he didn't need to make a, a billion dollars. He needed to make, he needed to make $900,000 a year to live this extravagant life. And, and he's like, you know, when you break it down, you, you know, you, you don't, you probably don't need to live, to live the life you really want. You probably don't need what you think you need. Yeah. 
Right. And so suddenly it becomes a lot easier right. to reach those goals and to reach those, those various levels of success, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like in my case, um, like it's, it's, you know, money based, like I, like I have that sort of th thought through, but then on top of that is like, well, what does the life look like? Like he wants to go to Aspen and whatever. Yeah. In my case, it's like, I want to get to the point where I can go to Iceland for at least a month to three months every summer uh, with my family because I want my daughter to learn Icelandic and learn, uh, you know, be as Icelandic as she can be because she's half Icelandic. We live here in Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, Arizona is a nightmare in the summertime. It's like 110 degrees. So it's awful. <laughs> so like that's obviously selfish on my end as well. But like being able to go there and like that's that's like a, a tangible dream. It's like, OK, oh, yeah. I have enough money. We we actually did a house swap uh, with a, a different house. They're not coming here. I wouldn't. I, that would be a tricky house swap. That would be like, haha, trick dude. Now you're <laughs> uh, but like we we are going there for a month for, um, you know, in July, and just to just to take a, a month long vacation in like a super mild, nice summer Iceland summer climate. Yeah. And so that she can, you know, run around and, and, and have fun and we can sort of, you know, have that, like, that sort of ideal life that yeah. I kind of have in my head. And yeah. that's, that's really what success is. It's not, I mean, you need money to get there, but how much? You don't yeah. need, you don't need a billion dollars, like you said, yeah. you, but you, you want to be realistic about the actual metrics. Yeah, it's important. It's important to know your numbers. You know, you, you were saying like when you reach different levels, you know, there's problems. There's a phrase called a uh, uh, new level, new devil. Right. I almost said that. I was like, there's a <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I have one more question for you. I always think this is a fascinating one as well. Uh, if you could go back yeah. to to when you were 20 years old and, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe go have have uh, have coffee with your 20 year old self at a cafe in Iceland uh -huh. uh, and sit across the table. Uh, what, what would be two things that you would tell your 20 year old self uh, to do differently? Hmm. I think I would try to work with more people, honestly. Um, okay. I feel like I, I like, I was probably lazier than I needed to be at that moment in my life. So I probably like be, be maybe be hunger. I mean, like, I'm lucky. I like found success and obviously I, it was hard work, but now looking back at it, like if I had worked a little bit harder on certain things and like put myself out there a little bit more and done and gone outside of my comfort zone, maybe a little bit more then maybe I would have had slightly different opportunities. Um, today you know i'm yeah. not saying i like i don't want to work harder today like that, yeah. that, that those days are gone <laughs> but like during that time maybe maybe put a little more more reps in more effort in all right so so that's one what would be what would be a second a second uh, thing that you would advise yourself that's really good though because that you know it, it's easy to get caught up um especially when you're younger you know yeah. uh not not being lazy not, not being lazy but you know not 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 putting in the effort that you knew that you were capable of. Yeah. Um, actually, here's a good one, even though it's super boring, but it's it's effective. And it should have, um, I should have just, so I should have just um, invested more. I should have, uh, mm. I should have put more money away. Uh, I should have, I should have used compound interest a little bit better. Uh, yeah. I obviously should have bought Bitcoin, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and maybe sold it. But um uh, but I think creating an automatic investment and sort of a, a not a retirement plan, you know, like a rich life or the new rich life, depending on who you follow, like Tim Ferriss or Ramit Sethi or any of those sort of like personal finance guys, they talk a lot about setting up your financial systems from the start, even when you're young and dumb, right? You know, just don't be don't be young and dumb for one day in your 20s, set it all up and forget about it. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it really is amazing. The, the difference, if you, if you ever go to like a compound uh, interest calculator, which you can go to on Google and you type in like, a, you know, like just $10,000, if, yeah. if you invested $10,000 at 23 years old yeah, and then you did nothing 
<laughs> after that, as opposed to if you started investing like a thousand dollars a year when you're 35 and you have a family and all that stuff, it's amazing the difference. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, what, what those, what those extra 12 years without even putting a penny in afterwards, um, would do, but, you know, at the same point, you know, you brought up Bitcoin and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine last night. I'm, I'm obviously not, I'm not really a big fan of, cause I don't really understand them, yeah. but, but, uh, that being said, I've been really getting into, especially in the music space for musicians, NFTs. Yeah. And, and I think that you know, moving forward, that's definitely something to start paying attention to. Um, because I think when it comes to investing, you know, there's that fear of like, oh, I got to learn the stock market. I have to learn all these stocks and mutual funds. And first off, if 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 you haven't read Tony Robbins' Money Master the Game, yeah. I've read a lot of money books. And that is, I, I always wrote that one off because I was like, Tony Robbins, what does he know about money? <laughs> he's he's a He's a personal development guy. Uh, but what he did is he interviewed, he had access to all these massive, you know, billionaires and he interviewed them. Basically it's, he was like the reporter. He reported all their information in that book by far uh, the, the best, the best book out there. Yeah. But, but at the same point, when it comes to for, for musicians, I, I think that one of the things that musicians need to really start paying attention to is NFTs. And here's why, because, you know, it's it's still starting. But the thing is, for a musician, when you sell your record, mm-hmm. you've sold it once and it's done. Now, now it can get passed around. We see this with like UCD stores and stuff like that. But as that music gets passed around, you don't get anything after that. And what's nice about an NFT is that in the actual meta data f- for the actual, uh, it's really a contract right. for that for that track, for that song, for that record. As people sell it in digital form. Yeah. You can constantly always receive, say, like a 10, 15% royalty on it. And this is a way for musicians to always hold on to their copyrights so that as their music is being passed around and sold, and especially in digital form, they're still always earning a royalty on it. And, and that that to me is, is the thing that I think in another five, six years in the music space is going to be widely accepted and and a complete game changer um, moving forward in the business for many years to come. So it's something to start paying attention to now, how you can start leveraging that and getting into it now, because that passive income will be tremendous, has the potential to be tremendous for you. Yeah. If you create, if you create great music. Right. right, right. Yeah. No, it's certainly a very interesting opportunity uh, in the music space as well. Uh, I actually, you touched upon this earlier, so I, I, I work uh, as a mentor at the University of Arizona. They, they have a Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, McGuire Center for Entrepreneurship, and I, I'm there mentoring student teams that are building businesses. And one of those teams is working on, because they changed the rules on like college athletes being able to uh, profit off their image, name, image, and likeness. And one of the opportunities there is the NFT market for the college athletes as well. So like, yeah. uh, it's it's certainly an, an interesting uh, era and an interesting interesting sort of sector of that industry. It really is. And and, and, uh, and the more you learn about it, the more you realize like it, it really works for even real estate. Yeah. You know, even if you have like collectibles, like old baseball cards, you know, some old valuable baseball cards and stuff like that. I mean, it's it really is a tremendous opportunity to... Um, you know, to at least start educating yourself a little bit, a little bit on, don't just write it off as something I wrote it off. I'll be honest with you. I wrote it off for about a year. Cause I saw people talking about, it. I was like, Oh, it's a fad. And then I, I just did a little bit of research and then I was like, Oh, I don't think it's a fad at all. Right. And I think a lot, a lot of it has to do, you know, because it's like in the digital digital realm. Right. So like the, the, the sort of sense of ownership of a digital thing is hard. Yeah. But, so this is sort of like a, one of the, t- the, the one facet of the problem that it actually solves. And because there is that um, there is that sense of ownership that a person that wants to patronage, you know, wants to be a patron of the arts or whatever, mm-hmm. can't really have can't really have that sense uh, um, and that emotion in the digital realm. Like I we rambled into an art uh, exhibit or like a showing uh, last, uh, last weekend and I bought a painting, 
Uh, and like I bought the painting because I'm like, well, this painting is amazing. It looks cool. It had like a really cool meaning to it. And I also bought it because like I no, I want the thing that's on the wall that is the original. I don't want the print. I want the original because I want to own the thing. I want to own the original piece. And like that's sort of like, it, you know, and that that hasn't been in that doesn't exist in the digital realm until right. t- until now in that in that sense and you know and then you know one, one of the reasons well it, it, why i'm bringing this up is because you want to think about the reasons people buy things they're buying things for so many different reasons like i was buying it like selfishly out of the coolness factor wanting the, the the wanting the ownership of it but i also just wanted to support this artist it was his first night uh i wanted him to have a win uh and like i wanted i wanted like the bot sticker to be on there for the duration of the show so that you know it's like the tip jar if you put a tip jar out when you're playing you have to put some money in it because it's the psychology of like people follow so if they yeah. see money in the tip jar they'll put more money in the tip jar. If yeah. they see that pa- the paintings are being bought, they might think about buying some paintings. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the other thing that for for musicians when it comes to this, and we'll get off this quickly because this was, <laughs> has nothing to do with, with today. But <laughs> the other thing that's fascinating about it is that, like, as a musician, what you can can do is you could release your record. You know, and you might think like, well, I mean, there's you know anyone can just listen to it. They can just download it. They can listen to it on on YouTube, etc. And this and that. But the cool thing that you can attach to it is you can attach like an exclusivity, like for example, like in, like if you only release say like a hundred authentic recordings, like as NFTs, yeah, that means that that along with that could come like special bonuses, like membership to a to some private type of thing that you do, where like once a month you do like a live show of some kind or, or a virtual show, whatever it is, yeah. But but by but the only people that can get access to it are the people that own the original. Now you can have people can stream your music all day long. They can listen to the digital file. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's kind of like take someone taking a photo of, like it's like me going to that art place and taking yeah. a photo with my phone of the piece of work that you bought. Yeah. I'd be like, that's fine. Bjorkman spent all that money on it. But look, I have it too. I have it in digital form. But the thing is, is that yeah. me but taking a photo it. of it. I, I don't own it, but at the same point, like if that artist did a thing where, hey, listen, only the people who own my art, only originals, they get they get blah blah blah. They get you know whatever it could be. It could be a ton of membership to something. It could yeah. be a, a, it could be an additional freebie, free hand drawn thing or whatever. Yeah. Even though I took a, fo- a digital photo of that at the, I, I never get access to it. I'm not part of that elite club. Right. And, and those are elements that that as artists musicians we've we've done stuff like that in the past where it's like if you you know if, if, if you help me out with with uh you know when i'm doing my crowdfunding for for my record you're going to get this kind of stuff well you can really attach stuff like that to the nft to where it's like when people have the original then whoever owns the original also gets access to whatever that thing and again keep in mind that as people sell that down the road you're still getting a royalty right so so bjorgman owns that that painting but I buy that painting from Bjorgman. Let's say again, it's, it's say like an, on an NFT. As an NFT, well, well, the thing is, is that the artist is also going to get a percentage of that. And now I'm in that inner circle of the artist. Right. Bjorgman's no longer in it. He sold, he sold his rights out of it. So <laughs> now I've taken his spot in that inner circle. And yeah. the artist collected money on that sale. Right. And, and as, as musicians, I think that that's a great way to create additional passive income. You know, something so, to think about. So, well, you know, I always, I always love to end these, uh, uh, these uh, interviews with our manifesto, with our, our real musicians don't starve manifesto. That is that real musicians are business owners, and our business is music. Now, a business is simply an organization where value is provided in order to make a profit. And unlike starving musicians who operate with a mindset of scarcity and fear. As success-driven musicians, we operate with a mindset of abundance, confidence, and service. We are doers, we are dreamers, we are creators, and we are achievers. We know that our true value is determined by how many people we serve and how well we serve them. Because our truth is, real musicians don't starve.
All right. All right. Well, Bjorkman, I, I would love for you to share with everyone how they can uh, learn more about you and, and uh, where they could pick up the book and where they could, you know, uh, get onto your mailing list and, and learn all the cool, literally the, the, the daily information and then the, and the uh, tips and strategies that you share when it comes to recording. Yeah, so um, audio issues or audio dash issues.com. You can go there. That's just my main, my main website. Uh, my book, You Get What You Give, uh, a simple story for finding success in the music business, you can find at you get what you give book.com. And then I have another book if uh, you're, the musicians here listening are wanting to get into mixing. I have step-by-step -step mixing, how to create great mixes using only five plugins. Teach you how to use EQ compression, reverb delay, saturation. So you can find that at stepbystepmixing.com. And if you get on the email list and you send me an email, I'll, I'll most likely reply to you. So that's the easiest way to get a, get a hold of me. Awesome, man. I, I really appreciate you coming and, and, and sharing with us and, uh, and uh, definitely encourage uh, those of you listening to go check out uh, what Bjorg Bjorgvin has to offer. Uh, I've been following him for a while and uh, he really has a heart for teaching and sharing. So you are not going to be let down. Trust me, uh, when, you, when you get on his list and you, you open up his emails and you, and you actually take action on, on what he has to share with you. Yeah, highly recommended to take action. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. We'll see you next time.